Well, good morning. Good to see you guys. And uh, the title of our message this morning is Leading Examples. And right now you're probably going leading examples. What in the world? But bear with me. It'll all come around. I, I strongly considered bringing a joke this morning, too, but the last, that EpiPen one, that was rough, wasn't it? So I'm like, eh, probably not. Maybe next time. I'll work on something. So who in here believes that teachers are leaders? Teachers are leaders. The word Christian is obviously very important to our beliefs, very important to the whole purpose why we're here, right? And I looked up the definition of it, and one of the definitions that I found is a Christian is one who becomes a dedicated follower of Christ, whose daily life and behavior is Christ-like. Now, I like to break things down. I like to study them and get down into the weeds and stuff. And so the Greek word for Christian is Christianos. And the suffix, the I-A-N-O-S, was originally applied to slaves who belonged to a great household or a master. So that was where that first came from. And so whenever you put those together, the Christianos, it's, it is literally a, a, a dedicated servant, a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ, a servant of Jesus Christ. And I know in today's world, it seems like that, that a lot of people claim to be a Christian, you know, and, and even up until recently, this country claimed to be a Christian country, like, and it was founded on Christian morals and values and standards, but if you look at the true meaning of Christian, to be a dedicated follower of Christ, I don't think that that's what, what we could say that this country is. And honestly, um, I don't think that if people looked at my life throughout the span of my life that they would necessarily say, oh, well, well yeah, he's definitely a Christian by um, my life and my behavior, my daily life and my daily behavior. So... That is, that's something that we have to strive for, though. So if you want to open up your Bibles with me, or flip, or wipe, or whatever you do with yours, we're going to go to Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. This is the Great Commission, and I'm going to read through it, and then we'll break it down just a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So when we started this out, I asked, who in here believes that a teacher is a leader? And pretty much everybody believes that you know if if somebody gets up especially in like a classroom setting most people whenever you think the term teacher you think of a teacher in a classroom like a school or whatever and if they're getting up they are leading their audience into um, knowledge and understanding and wisdom of whatever subject that it is so the definition of leader of a condensed definition is someone who guides other people but Verse 20, Matthew 28, verse 20 says, And teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Think about, just in your mind, 
Think about all the things that Jesus commanded his disciples and commanded the people uh, over the three and a half years of his ministry. Think about all the things that he said. Think about the things that stood out to you in particular. So whenever we go back into this Great Commission, I want to break it down before we move forward because this, this, is, this is amazing. So we know that we've got the 11 disciples, one of them hung themselves, and because it was Judas because he betrayed Jesus and he realized how horrible that was. So the rest of them, the 11 it says, they went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Jesus told them to go there, and they obeyed. So they were obedient to what he told them to do. He had been crucified, but he told them to go there. So they go there, and then he shows up. They were obedient. He shows up, and then as soon as they see him, they start worshiping. They're like, Jesus here he is, here he is. So they're worshiping him. It said some of them doubted though. I mean, you got to think like, we, here we are 2,000 years later and we've been reading the Bible and looking back over it. And, and we're like, some of them doubted? How could they doubt? Well, I'll tell you how they could doubt. Because they had just watched him be brutally tortured and murdered and hung on a cross and dead. And some of them helped to bury his dead body. So, I mean, it's somewhat understandable. Even though he told them, plain as day, I'm coming back. They're still like, they see him, they start worshiping. Some of them doubt it. But here's the thing. After they were obedient, it says that Jesus came to them. He told them where to go. He met them there. They were obedient. He met them there. When he tells you to do something, he's going to meet you there. He's going to meet you there absolutely will. And he, he verifies that down at the end. He says, he's telling them what happened. All authority in heaven and on earth, in heaven and on earth, has been given to him. So he's taking that authority and he's giving it back out. He's saying, now go and do this. He's taking that authority. He's giving the authority, go and make disciples. So a disciple is that dedicated follower. But he's telling his disciples, go and reproduce what I've told you. Go reproduce me into all the world. But here's what I love about this. Go and make disciples of all nations, not just the nation of Israel. Did you catch that? Like, you don't have to be from Israel. You don't have to be in Israel. He's saying, go and make disciples of all nations. Everybody's welcome. Everybody come along. Teach them my way. And then he says, so he gives three different commands here. Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. So baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's so many, there's so much... Um, controversy, if you will, around baptism these days. And some people don't want to say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, you know, they, they want to chop it up. Well, right here, Jesus tells them this is how you baptize them. And it's a big deal. It's a real big deal. But then he says to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Everything that Jesus commanded them within the three years that he was with them. Go and teach them this. I love it. So, He's telling us to teach. And you all agreed that teachers are leaders. So whether you think that you're a leader or not, you're called to be a leader of some sort. You're called to teach. And if teachers are leaders, then you're leaders. Okay? Whether you want to accept it or not, you need to start wrapping your head around it. You are going to teach. You're going to lead somebody somewhere sometime. That's what you're called to do. Okay, so I firmly believe, I firmly believe that to be a good leader, you must first be a good follower. Now, some people are like, well, being a follower has kind of a bad connotation to it. 
you know? You don't just want to be a follower. Well, you do if who you're following is Jesus Christ, okay? And that's who we're supposed to follow. So, holding in, in line with that, I asked myself, what does it take to follow? What does it take to follow? And I really started to break it down. And the first and foremost, whether you're going to be the best follower or you're going to be the best leader, obviously, both those things take the same thing. But the first and foremost thing is humility. If you're going to follow, you've got to be humble. If you're going to lead, you've got to be humble. It's an absolute must. So the definition of humility is a modest or low view of one's own importance of one's own importance not a modest or low view of yourself that's not what it says it says of your own importance putting other people before yourself their best interest before yourself that's the point here i want to give you some examples so obviously the the definition is leading examples so i want to break down some of some of my favorite examples in the Word and show you um, some reasons why um, they're what I picked. In 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6, it says, And be clothed with humility, for God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Have y'all ever had an opponent, a really good opponent, a really strong and powerful opponent, and it was so difficult to get your task accomplished, whether it's in sports or whatever? Imagine God, the creator of the universe and the creator of you, as your opponent. That's what he's saying. If you don't humble yourself, the opposite of humility is pride. If you want to go through whatever it is that you're doing and you want to hold on to pride, God's going to oppose you. And I don't know about any of you guys, but I've experienced the encouragement of the Lord when I've been proud. And uh, he gently encouraged me to do the right thing. And I'm telling you, his opposition is not fun to go through. So, But he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Who in here needs grace? I know I do. Every day, all day. So he gives grace to you whenever you're humble. Now, what if you say, Nathan, I, I don't want to be exalted, but, but whenever you humble yourself, God exalts you. Okay? It's just, it's, it's one of God's laws. And, and you're like, I know that the first will be last and the last will be first, but I don't want, I don't want to be exalted. I just want to remain, I want to remain humble. You know what I mean? And that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. But whenever you are humble and God exalts you, he exalts you for a reason. In your mind, what do you think that that reason could be? Do you think that it's to, to put a spotlight on you, to make everybody go, oh man, this person's so great. This person's so good. That's not it. Whenever God exalts you and he puts you in a place of authority or leadership, he's doing that so that you can help others come up. A good leader takes people from under them and tries to get them above them and tries to lift them up and build them up so that they can be who God's created them to be. But, but he didn't tell us to go out into all the world, into all the nations and make disciples so that we could rule and reign over them. He wants to be the one that the focus is on. So he exalts us and he puts us up in a place to be able to bring other people up and puts us on a, flat, a platform to be able to give him the glory, to give him the glory, not for us to get the glory. It's so, it's, it's so easy though to, to get out of balance with that. That's why he says, humble yourselves. That's something that I really want to point out here. In 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6, in verse 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves. 
It doesn't even say, pray for humility. Pray that I will humble you. It doesn't say, ask me to humble you. It says, humble yourself. This is a task that we have to do on our own. We've got to come to that place of humility on our own. Humble yourself. There's a saying, I've, I've, I've probably said it here before, but it says, if you believe that you are too big to serve, then you're too small to lead. If you're too big to serve, then you're too small to lead. And it's a fact. It's an absolute fact. Because that fine line, if you already think that you're too big going into it, you're going to fall right over that edge. It's going to be your demise. Now, we have a sign-up sheet out in the back. We have multiple areas in this church where, where we can serve, where we've got need for people to serve. And there are so many people in this church that serve, that give of their time and their energy, their effort, their love. They go out and meet people and take people places and, and all kinds of stuff. It's, that is the heart of God, is to love Him and to love others. And that's part of that loving others, is serving. So, one of the examples that I wanted to use for humility is Moses. Everybody loves Moses, right? Moses, he, he's an interesting cat, for sure. I'm, I'm using cat because God always says cat, and it kind of sticks in my head sometimes. But he's an interesting dude, right? So, in Numbers 12, verse 3, it says, Now Moses was the most humble person or meek person, more than any other person alive. Can you imagine having that said about you? That would be amazing. And that's who Moses was. But a little bit of backstory on Moses, right? He was, the, the king of the time wanted to kill all the boys. God spared his life. He's a little baby, gets to, gets to grow up in the palace. Grow up in in the best of everything, with the richest family in the known world. But he's going on, and he, he knows that God has told him that he's going to, going to help save the Israelites, right? And one day he sees, he sees this Egyptian beating on this, this uh, Hebrew, and he goes and kills him, buries him in the sand. It's like... Hey, Moses, that was, that was kind of extreme, don't you think? I mean, dang, man. But he thought he did a good thing. And then the next day he goes out and he sees two Hebrews fighting. And he's like, hey, 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 knock it off. And they're like, whoa, what are you going to do? Kill us and bury us in the sand too? And he's like, you, you, you saw that? I didn't know anybody saw that. <laughs> key, key number one, if you're going to kill somebody, don't let anybody else see you. You know, <laughs> that's, that's a bad idea, Moses. Like, but anyhow, so they see him, he takes off, he, he leaves, and he goes out, and he's, he's literally living in the wilderness, and, and he's a shepherd for this guy, and, and gets married at the time, and all this stuff. Life's good until he runs into God, and God says, hey, you're going back to Egypt. He's like, what? Uh, and and Moses' humility in this conversation, he's so humble that he tells God that he can't do it. If God is speaking to you in the middle of a bush that's burning and God's voice is coming out telling you to go do something, I don't know, is the first thing you're going to think, I can't do that. If a bush can burn and start talking to you, you can probably do whatever it tells you to do. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking. So, so anyway, he tells him, and, and, and fast forward, he finally gives in. He's going. And here's something that I'm just going to throw this in here because it's pretty wild. I'm not going to read all of it, but I will tell you the very first time that I ever came across this set of scriptures, and if you want to look it up, you can. It's Exodus 4, verse 24 through 26. It's three little verses. It jumped out, smacked me in the face, and I'm like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Like, and I had, read, I had read through this several times, and I'd never seen this. Again, it's Exodus 4, 24 through 26. Long story short, Moses is on his way to Egypt, 
and God is coming to kill Moses. So whatever Moses did in this time frame, it doesn't say, all I know is he argued with God, and God's coming to kill him. He's like, yeah, you're going, but you've really upset me by this point. And so Moses' wife takes a flint, circumcises their son, rubs the blood on Moses' feet, and says that we are, we are in a blood covenant, and so God lets Moses live. I'm telling you, if you haven't read this story, you're probably thinking, Bridge, you've lost your mind. Honestly, I, I, the first time I read it, I'm like, what? What happened here? So, anyhow, I think that it's just wild because the first time that I read it, I thought, you know what, I wonder how many times God was going to kill me, but didn't because of my wife. And then I thought, I wonder how many times my wife was going to kill me, but didn't because of God. So, I don't know, we'll have to talk about that later to find out. I'll let you know if she tells me. But Moses, he's super humble, right? Super humble guy. And he goes, he, he, essentially, God instructs Pharaoh to release the Hebrews, the Israelites, and he's taking them out. Well, Moses is such an awesome dude that he's, he's leading these people, and there's tons of them, but they start grumbling against him, him and Aaron, his brother. They start grumbling all the time. They're really upset with, with Moses. And what's wild is he's so humble that even though they're upset, I mean, they, they literally are like, they put a group of people together to come against Moses and, and overthrow him and stuff. And he still falls down on his face in front of God and asks God, God, protect your people. Please don't. Don't come against them. Don't harm them. Don't let, your, don't let your wrath and your fury burn against them. That's how humble he is. Fourteen times the Bible documents that this whole group of people that he just let out of slavery and that God is feeding them because of him, giving them all the water because of them, making sure their shoes don't wear out, making sure their feet don't swell, and... and and taking care of them and providing for them all this time, they come and they, they grumble against him and they try to essentially kill him 14 different times. That's a lot. I mean, that's a lot. But I strongly recommend that you guys start looking into this because there's a couple people in number 16. Their name is Korah and, and Dathan, and they round up 250 people. This is just one of those instances. They round up 250 people uh, against Moses and Aaron, and then God plans to kill them because of how how bad they're treating Moses. And Moses and Aaron fall on their face. They're, They're asking God not to destroy all these people, but God tells them, get away from those guys. And he's like, okay. And so they back up, and and essentially God tells Moses, I'm gonna open up the ground and swallow these dudes up. Them and their families, everybody, I'm going to swallow them up. And so he does. He swallows up those two and their family. And as the rest of them are trying to leave, they're still mad at Moses and stuff. God burns them. I mean, melts them. And then uh, and then the cool thing is, is that they had these censors because they were the leaders, the, the religious leaders at the time, and they had these censors that like smoked and stuff, you know, with incense. They were still in the ashes of the bodies of the people that God just smoked, right? And, and God tells them uh, to have Eleazar go and take those censers up, hammer them out to flat to where the, uh, they would literally cover the altar so that everybody else would see those things and remember not to go against God's chosen. The reason that I'm telling you all this is because the whole time Moses remained humble and God protected him against, against all of it against all of it, and then even prepared for for people to realize that God spoke directly with him, that God put him on that path to do that so that they would would not continue to come against him. And 
they were really slow learners, but nevertheless, um, nevertheless, God did continue to protect over and over and over Moses. So the second thing that I was thinking whenever, whenever I was thinking, okay, what are the, what are the ways to follow? Was you have to have a willing obedience or a willing submission. Now, I know a couple weeks ago, Scott talked about this. He hit on it a little bit, too, in his teaching um, about how submission is really difficult. It's super difficult, right? Like, nobody really wants to submit, but it's very, very necessary. And so the, the example that I wanted to use for this is Abraham and Isaac. Everybody knows the story of Abraham and Isaac, right? In Genesis 22, it says, Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. The region of Moriah. That's going to come back up here in a little bit. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. God tells Abraham to take his son, sacrifice him on a mountain in the region of Moriah that he's going to tell him about. And so Abraham was immediately obedient. Immediately obedient. It says on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He looked up and saw the place in the distance. It was Mount Moriah is what he was looking at. But the angel of the Lord, so he gets there, he's getting ready to sacrifice him does everything that God told him to do. He literally, it says, he raises his hand to follow through with the command that God had given him. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham replied, here I am, Lord. The angel of the Lord replied, do not lay your hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So here's Abraham. He has this relationship with God. He communicates with God. He trusts God. He reveres God. He knows that God created everything, and God is the one that gave him this son. And God promised him already that he was going to make his descendants as numerous as the stars, as numerous as the sand on the sea, right? And yet God's telling him to give this back to me. And he's immediately willing, immediately obedient. But hear me clearly here. How many Isaacs do you think have been sacrificed by people who have listened to what the Lord said, but not to what he's saying now? How many Isaacs have been sacrificed? Because people have listened, but they're not listening now. They're so focused on what God did say, that whenever he calls out again and says, Abraham, Abraham, stop, don't, don't do that. But whenever we, whenever we don't stay in that constant communication with him, we might be going down a path that he told us to go down. But if we continue down that path and we're not listening to what he says now, it could bring absolute destruction and devastation in our life. We've got to remain obedient to him and submit to what he's saying right now. The third thing, the third thing is to have a belief in something greater than oneself. If you're going to be a good follower and in turn become a good leader, you've got to have the belief that what it is that you're following What it is that you're leading other people to follow is greater than yourself. Have you ever heard of the salesperson that that doesn't really believe in the product that they're trying to sell? 
they're not very, uh, they're not very good at. But whenever they believe and they've got that passion and that understanding, they, they know this is the right thing. It's the right thing for you. They can sell it all day long because they know it. They believe it. It's the same thing. So, the third, the third example that I want to give is King David. He was called the man after God's own heart. Did he struggle? Sure. Did he sin? Yes. Was he willing to repent? Yes, immediately. As soon as he was called out on it, he was willing to repent and start going back that direction. But even David, from a very young, from a very young age, we know that he was a shepherd. He killed a bear. He killed a lion. I mean, he was, he was, he, he was even ruddy. He was small, a little guy, but bad enough to kill a lion and a bear, you know? And bad enough to kill the most vicious warrior that the world had ever seen at that point, Goliath. So, he had a belief in something that was so much greater than himself that he was willing to go to the battle line and face Goliath. And what did he tell King Saul? It doesn't matter. Like, my God will take care of this problem. He knew. He had that belief within himself. 2 Samuel 22 47. This is something that David himself wrote. He says, The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be my God, the rock of my Savior, or the rock of my salvation, some say. That was his, and he wrote stuff like this. The whole 2 Samuel 22 is, is a straight up uh, song of him singing God's glory and God's praises because he loved him so much and he had seen God work in him. He had experienced that relationship with him. But he had that absolute undeniable faith, that belief in something greater. 2 Samuel uh, 7 verse 2 is, David said to Nathan the prophet, he says, Look, I'm living in a palace made of cedar wood, but the ark of God is in a tent. He he was uncomfortable that God had made him so comfortable, but he hadn't done anything to, uh, to prepare a dwelling place for his God. His God was still in a tent. It did happen to be the tent that God told them to make, and it was exactly the way God wanted it. But that was his, that was his heart, his passion, his desire. So, if you all know the story, God didn't let David end up making the, the, um, uh, the temple for the Lord. His son got to make it. Solomon got to make it. And something else that's interesting is the site for the future temple. David chose the site for the future temple that Solomon made. And that site was on Mount Moriah where Abraham had built the altar to sacrifice his son Isaac. It was the same place that all of that had taken place. Isn't that interesting? God pointed out to Abraham, go to Mount Moriah, that's where I want you to sacrifice your one and only son. That's where I want you to do it. He showed him that. Then King David told his son uh, Solomon, build the temple right here. This is where I want you to build it. Very, very interesting. And then, the fourth and final example that I want to give is the lead example and that is King Jesus. King Jesus. So, in the very beginning, in the Great Commission, we read that Jesus told them to go do these things, to lead by example. Go teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. He says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So think about that passage right there. They were obedient. They go up there. Jesus shows up after he had been killed, crucified, and rose again. He lets them know, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you, is what he's telling them. So then, Jesus, he is absolute love. God is love. Jesus is God. And loving is leading. Loving is leading. 
If you love people, you don't want them to suffer. You don't want them especially to suffer through eternity without God, right? So loving them is doing what Jesus commanded us to do and leading them to be like Christ. Loving is leading. Matthew 20, 20 through 28 says that Jesus, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve. So, if He came not to be served, but to serve, should we expect to be served, or should we expect to serve? If we're to be like Christ, we have to serve, because Jesus, that's what He did. He served. That's who He was. That's who He commands us to be. In Matthew 14, 13 through 14, it says, After John the Baptist was killed, Jesus wanted to be alone, but the people followed him. They followed him. John the Baptist was his cousin. He had just had his head chopped off. Jesus was mourning. He felt pain. He felt hurt. He felt grief. And his head was cut off. He wanted to mourn for his cousin. But... As he's going to try to get to a place where he was alone, where he could spend some time and just mourn and spend time with the Father and communicate with him and, and, and work through this process of loss of his family member, all these people followed him. Do you know that he didn't react in the way that I would have reacted? He didn't get angry and bent out of shape. He didn't, you know, tell him to leave. He didn't make them leave. He didn't any of that stuff. What he did is, the word says that he had compassion on them. In his, in his time of, of despair, he had compassion on everybody else. And at this point, he started healing the sick among them. He started healing them. And then, this is where he fed the 5,000 people with the three barley loaves and the two little fish. That's when this happened, right after his cousin was killed. That's when this happened. That's Jesus. That's Him being that example for us. He suffered constant rejection. And that's one of the things that, that we, we don't want to go through is rejection, right? But He suffered it all the time, and even His family rejected Him. Even His family didn't necessarily think that He was the Messiah, the Christ, but He was. And He was not bothered by things that bothered other people. This is one of the crazy things about Jesus that I just absolutely love. Do you remember whenever Jesus and his disciples, are, they're all cruising down the road, and these blind men realize that Jesus is the one walking by. And they've heard of Jesus. Everybody heard of Jesus. You start healing people, uh, sick people, raising Lazarus from the dead and stuff like that, you're going to draw some attention. These, these blind guys, they know that Jesus is going by, and they start yelling for him, Jesus, son of David, heal me. And his disciples are trying to shut these guys up. What? what? Have you guys not been with Jesus this whole time? You know, they try, they try to shut him up. Jesus stops them from trying to shut him up. And he takes care of the, the situation. He heals them, right? Then the children, they always want to play with him. Have you ever been around people that are like, these stinking kids? It's easy to deal with kids whenever they're your own kids, right? But when they're not your kids, it's a lot harder to deal with them. Well, if you don't know, Jesus wasn't married and he didn't have any kids. But kids loved Jesus, and he loved them. And his disciples, again, tried to keep the kids from coming to Jesus. And he says, stop, let them come to me. That's why I'm here. And then he uses that situation to minister to them, too. He had this constant onslaught of questions and accusations being spewed at him by the religious leaders of the time, the people that knew the law, that knew the Torah, that knew what... what the law was supposed to be, right? Inside and out, upside and down. But Jesus came and said, you're absolutely wrong. And he constantly had to deal with that with these people, constantly. They were trying to just rule with an iron fist over everybody. But then even in Luke 22, 51, one of my favorite verses, Jesus, he's being captured, right? And, and this whole mob of people come to get him. Well, fortunately, he had just told his disciples, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and get one. And they're like, hey, we've got two swords. He's like, good enough. That'll do. 
because you know Peter's going to have one, and whenever we get there, so he's, he's being taken. He's being taken to go get crucified, and he knows what's coming. But Peter, being Peter, whips out a sword. He's like, Jesus told me, sucker. Wham! And, and like, cuts the dude's ear off. It's like, come on, Peter. If you're going to do something, do something. But he cuts, he cuts the guy's ear off, right? And Jesus, Jesus being Jesus, tells Peter first, stop. We're not doing that like this. But he uses that situation, puts the dude's ear back onto his head. Fortunately, it was probably right side up and everything. Imagine if he stuck that thing on upside down, though. I would have just for the heck of it. Like, you came to get me, bud. Like, deal with the upside down ear. Like, sorry. But he puts it back on. I bet that dude didn't follow them to take him, you know? I bet he was like, peace out. I'm heading home. Um, but that was Jesus' reaction. Even the people that were coming to get him to go put him on a cross, he loved them anyway. That was his what he's telling us, this is how I want you to lead. I want you to follow me and lead. This is what I want you to do. And think about this. So we're going back just a little bit to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. When he's finding his disciples, what did he say to the very first disciple? He said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I will teach you how to fish and catch people because that's what matters. It's not how much money you can put in the bank. It's not how many fish you can catch to get yourself rich. What matters is people. This is what matters. So come and follow me. I'm going to teach you how to do what's going to change your life for all of eternity. So he was the greatest example the absolute greatest example. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no man. No one has greater love than someone who would lay his life down for his friend. Loving is leading. And you don't have any more love than somebody that's willing to lay your life down for your friend. Jesus, he played that out. He showed us clearly. So Solomon's temple. I know I've been hitting on this Mount Moriah thing, right? Throughout the whole message. Solomon's temple was built on Mount Moriah. That mountain where God told Abraham to sacrifice his one and only son. God the Father. Who, when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist, spoke from heaven. Heaven ripped open and God spoke and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's his one and only son. God told Abraham to, to sacrifice Isaac right there, and he was willing and obedient. David told Solomon to build the temple where we're going to worship God forever on Mount Moriah, right here. And he did. And then Jesus, God's one and only son, was crucified about 800 yards from where that temple stands today. On Mount Moriah, his one and only son was sacrificed for our sin. Did pay the ultimate price for our sin. So that we could have that relationship with him. He atoned for all of our sins. And while he's being sacrificed right there, in that place, that God has strategically put so many amazing things happening right there, while he's hanging on this cross with his body shredded and his guts hanging out, literally, while he's right there, Jesus himself looks down and as our example says, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. He asked God the Father to forgive them for crucifying him and hanging him on that cross. And he says, come, follow me. I'm going to teach you how to catch people. Be, follow my example. And that was his example for us. We're all Christian leaders. We're all Christians. We're all leaders. We're all Christian leaders. 
I gave you the definition of Christian. I gave you the definition of leader. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do. And that's what we're supposed to be. God has given us the greatest examples to follow. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything Jesus has commanded us. And remember, the last one, and remember, He's always with you. Always. Whether it feels like He is or isn't, He says, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Whatever I've called you to do, I'm going to equip you to do. Just be obedient and do it. And it'll be worth it. So, I want to close with this statement. Follow the greatest example and lead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us such great examples to be able to follow. Thank you for equipping us to lead people into your presence into a relationship with you, God. Thank you for being our guide, the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path, Lord. God, I pray that you will keep us from sacrificing the Isaacs in our life because we aren't listening to you currently. Lord, help us to hear you now. Help us to be willing to and obedient to listen to you right now with what you're telling us right now. Lord, I pray that you will give us the strength where we're weak, build our faith where our faith is small, and help us to keep our eyes fixed on you and everything that we do. Lord, I pray that as you Give us divine appointments to meet with people and to share your love with them, God. Pray that you will remove fear from our midst. Crush that fear, God. Pull it out of our hearts and out of our minds. Help us to be obedient and submit to our authority and to you, Lord God. And we pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.